Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke. I'm going to do uh, part two today of the study of the devil. Uh, if you did not see part one, it is already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, I did that last Sunday. Um, if you've been following my hangouts over the years, uh, you'll, you've noticed that um, I've been doing topical studies. It was uh, refuting Paul onlyism or defending uh, Jesus, John, and Peter. Uh, and I've done many topical studies uh, all on my channel. Uh, but recently I, I started doing character studies. The first characters that we did was a study of Adam and Eve. Uh, and now uh, the next significant character that we see in the scriptures uh, is the devil, Satan, the uh, serpent, the, uh, Lucifer. And so what I'm doing is I'm just going to go through the scriptures, uh, every verse that contains any of those words and read scripture and discuss it. But I, I'm gonna to try to remember to incorporate a slogan that uh, I got from brother uh, uh, Joe Byron. Um, his YouTube channel is Sebastian Dresden. Uh, when I was doing the study on Paul onlyism, refuting Paul onlyism, and I discussed the verse uh, rightly dividing the word of truth, uh, Brother Joe suggested that uh, I try to use and popularize the term rightly uniting the word of truth. I think that is a wonderful idea, so I'm going to try to incorporate that and uh, kind of sloganize it. So in all these studies, is always rightly unite the word of truth, show how uh, all the scriptures, uh, the entire canon, how to harmonize them all, how to make sense of it all, and rather than uh, looking in terms of dividing and, and uh, t like tearing out some books some, um, uh, and uh, at the cost of the others. And, um, the Paul only, has the, the mistake that they make is um, elevating Paul's writings above everything else and excluding all the other scriptures. So uh, I'm going to try to continually write unite the word of truth as I go through all these studies. Uh, now I'm, I'm going to uh, pick up where I left off. I'm on Bible Hub. I'm looking at all the appearances, the occurrences of the word uh, Satan right now. And the next one I come to is 1 Timothy 1.20. Let's look at that. It says, uh, first look at the first in KJV. Um, it says, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Okay, so we see the word Satan in this verse, but what can we learn from it? Um, and this is the Apostle Paul talking, and in context, uh, uh, he Let's look at a few verses before and see what we can learn. Uh, verse Starting verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the, the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. 
So at the very end of this letter of 1 Timothy, we get this next part referring to Satan. This charge I commit unto the son, Timothy. You see, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, wrote these letters to Timothy and also to uh, uh, Titus. They're called the pastoral epistles. Uh, Paul was instructing Timothy and Titus how to conduct themselves as pastors. He said, this charge I committed to the son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. All okay. right. Well, I think when we see it in context, um, Paul is talking about the idea that uh, um, holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So the subject is the doctrine of faith and that how some people have uh, uh, put away faith as the sole means of salvation and they, they he says he's made it shipwreck which is he's ruined it they've ruined the gospel they've ruined the message of salvation because they have not accepted the doctrine of faith alone and then he refers to two individuals of whom is Hymenius and Alexander whom I have delivered unto Satan that they may not learn that they may learn not to blaspheme and when he uses this word blaspheme about them, Hymenius and Alexander, and he also used the word blaspheme earlier uh, when he was discussing himself. He said, talking about himself, he says, uh, Paul, who was a before a blasphemer and a persecutor uh, of the church. We have, you probably know that before Paul became the apostle Paul, uh, he was a Pharisee, zealous for the law. Uh, he was, at that time, his name was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He was given the, the task of rounding up and, and uh, uh, imprisoning and punishing uh, all these first Christians, these first believers. And uh, he said he, Paul said he persecuted the church before he got saved. So on that verse there, of course, there's proof that Paul was not the first member of the church because he said before he was saved, he was persecuting the church. Uh, but here he's saying that he was a blasphemer. And then he calls Hymenius and Alexander blasphemers. And the blasphemy was uh, teaching of the, the, the false gospel, the faith alone is insufficient. And so what does he do? He says that he has delivered them unto Satan. Uh, I think this goes along with the kind of instructions that uh, I've given people in several of my videos in trying to um, help people uh, learn how to deal with others on YouTube. Uh, I think that it is our responsibility to spread the seeds of the gospel, to be ready in season and at all times, to be ready to tell people the good news about Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and what he's promised us. Uh, but some people don't have ears to hear. I made a, a video titled, Who Are the Swine? And referencing the saying Jesus came up with is don't cast your pearls to the swine. He described these people of those who do not have ears to hear. So I think it is our responsibility as Christians to, to tell people the good news, but we've got to have enough sense, enough discernment to recognize uh, someone who doesn't have ears to hear.
someone who is, as Jesus would call them, the swine. And once we determine that that's the kind of person we're dealing with, then let's move on. Uh, and move on. Just, okay. We're not going to have any, any more interaction with them because they've proven to us they're not listening. It's a waste of time. So let's just, they want to reject this good news. Let Satan have them. Let Satan go with them. And because that's what he's going to do. Satan loves all those who reject the good news. And he's going to continue to try to ensnare them and keep them in darkness. So Paul says that he has delivered unto Satan Hymenaeus and Alexander, and that's what he's referring to. Uh, these, they're blasphemers. They have uh, contradicted the, the mess, true message of salvation that we're saved by faith alone. And therefore, Paul has determined that they're, they're blasphemers and they should be just turned over to Satan. And Paul's going to move on. And he's telling Timothy and everybody else, just move on. Let Satan deal with them. Okay, that's how I see that. Uh, now let's move on to the next occurrence of the word Satan. Uh, we find that in uh, 2 Corinthians, let me see. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Uh, It says, uh, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Uh, again, this, this is a verse that references the word, the name, the person, Satan. So what can we learn from this? As always, we want to study it in context. So let's go back at least a few verses. Start with verse 7. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. In all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore? Because I love you not. No, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion that wherein they glory they may be found even as we for such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light therefore it is of no great thing in if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end it shall be according to their works. Um, Paul goes on in the following verses to uh, talk about his all of the things he's endured since he got saved, all the sufferings he's gone through. But what does it mean? Uh, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So Paul is talking about the false teachers. Uh, just as Jesus talked about the, the false teachers when he said that uh, they, uh, you will know them by their fruit. Uh, that's a, a, another section that's greatly misunderstood. A lot of people think that uh, you will know them by their fruit refers to uh, uh, is, is someone a real Christian? Well, if they're bearing fruit, you'll know if they're a real Christian. But in context, it's, it's not talking about someone being saved. It's talking about someone teaching and, and uh, particularly a false teacher or a false prophet. And uh, the fruit of a false prophet or false converts. And this is the same subject that Paul's talking about here. It says that... Uh, um, 
for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no marvel for Satan himself was transferred into an angel of light. So these are false apostles, they're false prophets, false teachers, teaching salvation by works. And uh, Paul warns us that don't be deceived, uh, because even Satan can make himself appear as an angel of light and seem very appealing and tickle our ears and deceive many. Uh, when Paul says Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, it makes me think of two, uh, there's maybe more cases like this, but I know of two that come to mind. Uh, an example of um, an angel of light appearing to someone and giving them a, a false message. And uh, one example is um, Muhammad. Uh, now, I don't know if Muhammad made up the entire thing or if Muhammad actually had an angel appear to him. He said the angel Gabriel appeared to him uh, and told him basically that, you know, uh, Judaism and Christianity were wrong. The, the scriptures were not correct and they needed to be corrected. And, and uh, Muhammad says this angel, the Quran, he's writing so that now people could know the truth. Uh, so he wrote the Quran and he got the information from an angel. So this is a perfect example of what can happen when a person listens to a spirit who is um, contradicting. See, we, we're supposed to test the spirits. Uh, we, we ask them, is Jesus the Christ? And, and uh, the spirit will, if he says, yes, he, Jesus is the Christ, and then we can trust the spirit. Uh, if it's a, a demonic spirit or Satan appearing as an angel of light, then they, they cannot say, yeah, Jesus is the Christ. And we, we know that the Christ means that he is the Son of God, the Savior, manifest in the flesh. Uh, and so um, the, the angel of light uh, appears very att attractive, but it's just a deception from the devil. And from this, we got Islam. And another example of the same thing happened is Mormonism. Exactly the same kind of scenario. Uh, Joseph Smith. He was a con man, but so I don't know if he made up the entire thing, just as I don't know if Muhammad just made up everything. But they both claimed that an angel appeared to, to them. Uh, Muhammad said it was Angel Gabriel. Uh, Joseph Smith says it was the Angel Moroni. <laughs> just the name Moroni should be a dead giveaway that something's wrong. Because if you take the, the last letter off the word, the letter I, remove it, you're left with the word moron, M-O-R-O-N. And I, I think that's what happens. It's, it's, it is moronic to believe the teachings of Joseph Smith. But there is a, a YouTuber, and now he's an author, written several books, uh, Chris, um, Chris Putnam. And he has a, a video, I think you can find it still on YouTube, called Mo and Joe. And he does this comparison, showing the similarities between Muhammad and Joseph Smith. But uh, it was a very identical type of thing. Either they both deceived us, or they both were deceived. Because an angel of light appeared to them and told them that Judaism and Christianity were both wrong. The scriptures were wrong, needed to be corrected. A new book was necessary. So the angel gave them the, the new book. The angel Gabriel gave Muhammad the book Quran. Uh, the angel Moroni gave Joseph Smith the book of Mormon. And so 
The same kind of thing uh, happened, and uh, look what the result is. In Islam, we have the largest, or certainly one of the largest uh, religions of the world. Certainly false, false uh, religion. Everything about it is false. Uh, and then we have Mormonism. It's pretty small. Let me see. Mormonism, my notes here. Um, there's only about 15 million Mormons in the entire world. I think in uh, uh, Islam, I think there's two, over 2 billion, over 2 billion uh, Muslims of varying kinds. But here Paul is cautioning, cautioning us all uh, that uh, even if even if an angel appears to you and they're teaching you something contrary to what, what we get out of the scriptures about salvation, that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, Paul says in Galatians, they are anathema, they're cursed. It's another gospel that can't save you. And here in Corinthians, he, he reminds us that even Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Okay, let's tr look at the next verse uh, that we see the, the word Satan, see what we can learn. Uh, okay, uh, well, Luke 11, 18, I've already discussed that last time. Okay, let's look at Romans 16, 20. KJV. Uh, and the God in, of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Hmm. Well, it's Romans uh, 16, 20. Let's start with verse 17 and get some context. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For you, your obedience has come abroad unto all men. Glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And then he has his closing remarks. Uh, um, but we're looking at the word Satan and in this case, he says, and the God of peace, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, uh, eternal God Almighty, manifest in the flesh, shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So, in context, Paul cites divisions which are coming into the church as he's established. A lot of people are not aware of this, but Paul taught Timothy and uh, Paul did not really work as a pastor. He did not really settle into one location for years at a time to become pastor of a congregation. His, his mission was much bigger than a congregation of 10 or 50 people. Uh, he, he, he traveled all over the known world at that time. Uh, as a missionary, an evangelist, and a church planter. And many of the churches that he's established all over, he stayed in communication with them uh, through letters. And this is uh, a letter to the uh, church in Rome. The, the, the book is called Romans. And uh, he's citing in this section here that mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Well, what I've discovered over the years 
is that the problems that I've had to deal with in my ministry before I was on YouTube and now for almost eight years on YouTube, um, many of these problems are because of, uh, are within the church itself, or certainly if not the true church within what is called Christendom, those who are professing to be Christians. And there's a lot of divisions and it is really uh, like a full-time job just defending the, the true message of salvation against the, these false messages. And, but, but the problems that we deal with now in terms of all the false teachings, uh, we can go back to the epistles, not only Paul's, but even uh, Peter and John mentioned in, in their epistles about these false doctrines entering into the church and uh, whether the doctrine was that Jesus didn't rise in the flesh or that the resurrection has already happened uh, or that Judaism must continue to be practiced or that Paul was a false apostle. Uh, all of these accusations, all these false teachings entered into the beginning of church. We can find them all throughout the, the epistles. And these are the things that we're still arguing about today. But Paul instructs us here, he says, mark them that cause divisions. Uh, I've had to divide with a, a lot of people over the years uh, be, because they are, I have a video called uh, Nitpickers. Uh, nitpickers, uh, fault finders, something like that. Uh, and be, because it seems that some people, their entire purpose is, is uh, based on trying to find fault in others, trying to stir up trouble, uh, trying to cause in uh, some of the people I've, I've separated from or have been teaching false doctrines. Some of them, it's not a doctrinal issue, it's just a, a divisive issue that they, they just seem to want to like stir up trouble all the time. But these troublemakers uh, that cause divisions, Paul says that we mark them and avoid them. So I've had to do that numerous times. Even recently I had to block someone who was, you know, one, previously one of my best friends on YouTube because this person was just continually trying to find fault with everyone and constantly just stirring up trouble. Basically, I concluded that he was a troublemaker. <clears throat> so Paul says we mark them, that means classify them as a troublemaker and then avoid them. And and he then, got, Paul goes on to promise them something. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So in other words, these people who are causing these divisions are basically doing the work of Satan. And Paul says that God will bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Uh, that means that he's going to, God will intervene and take care of the problem. These people who are causing these divisions, uh, you mark them and, 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 and uh, avoid them and just trust that God's going to deal with them. God will deal with them. them. And whether they realize it or not, they're doing the work of Satan by either teaching false doctrine or just by trying to stir up trouble within the body. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at the next verse here. This is, uh, let me see. That was Romans 16, 20. Hmm. That can't be it. That can't be all of the occurrences, Satan, 50 occurrences. The word Satan appears 50 times in the scriptures. Um, Satan's fall, Satanism, accuser, poser. 
Well, I don't think I've discussed all 50 of these occurrences of Satan, so let's look at some more of them. Okay. Okay. Well, here's an interesting one, Matthew sixteen twenty three. Uh, let's look at that in the KJV first. Uh, but he turned. This is Jesus. But Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Hmm. Well, Jesus is talking to Peter, and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. So is Peter Satan? Is Jesus calling Peter Satan? Is Jesus is Peter possessed by Satan? Well, let's look at it in context and see if we can learn anything. I'll, I'll go back to. Um, I think we need to go back to uh, not verse nineteen. No. Okay, now let's go back to the point where uh, Peter had proclaimed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Jesus tells them, don't tell anybody this. This is true, but don't tell everybody this. It's not, it's not ready to be revealed to the general public yet. And, and then in verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem, and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Before I go on, I want to pass up the opportunity to refute Paul Onlyism. Paul Onlyism will tell us that you can only learn about the true message of salvation, the death, burial, and resurrection from Paul's letters. But right now we're reading uh, the gospel account of Matthew. And uh, in in Matthew, and this also appears in Mark and Luke. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke have the same account, the same um, statement. Uh, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things. What did he suffer? He was uh, arrested. He was beaten. He was put on trial. Uh, he was uh, scourged. Uh, and, and then he was uh, rejected by the Jewish people. And he was executed. He was nailed to a cross and suffered and died. And then he was buried. And then he was raised from the dead on the third day. And this is exactly what 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 tells us, which we know is the gospel. And as I showed in my teaching, Refuting Paul Onlyism, this message about the death, burial, and resurrection for our salvation is uh, throughout all the scriptures, and all the way back, Genesis, all the way through the Bible. But um, let me see, something happened here. Uh, 1621. Something happened. It skipped me. Okay. Uh, but the important thing to understand here is that uh, uh, Jesus himself preached the gospel. Now, Apollonius will say, no, you can't get the gospel from anybody but Paul. Only in Paul's writings. But right here, we have from Jesus' own mouth, he's telling his disciples how he would go to Jerusalem, he'd suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed. That's just that's his death on the cross, be raised again the third day. 
So we have the gospel being preached by Jesus. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. So Jesus was telling them about the gospel, the good news that he's going to die for the sins, but if you don't worry, he'll be raised from the dead. And then uh, uh, Peter, he thought he was being virtuous by saying, no, he won't let it happen. Uh, and it, and, and, but that's why Jesus came. Jesus said, do not think that I came to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. So Jesus tells us the reason he came down from heaven was the very fact of him dying. He came to die for our sins. Uh, and so that was the whole point of him incarnating so that he could die. He, as God, he couldn't die. He had to become a man so that he could die for our sins. And yet Peter wants to prevent that from happening. And this has been the plan all throughout scriptures from uh, Genesis uh, uh, when uh, the, the first illustration of this was when uh, uh, God uh, provided an animal skin to cover Adam and Eve. They were trying to cover themselves, solve the problem of nakedness by working and sewing fig leaves and then covering themselves and thinking that through their own efforts they can solve this problem. And God didn't accept that. He had covered them himself with animal skin. And the animal skin represented death and the blood. So only through death and blood could the situation be solved and only by God providing this covering could the problem be solved. So all through scripture, we're told about the death, burial, and resurrection. And Peter here is trying to take in a position where he's not going to let it happen. He said, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Peter is rebuking Jesus. <laughs> oh, man, the nerve of this guy. He was very impulsive, very bold and impulsive at times, and then on other times, cowardly. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be, un be unto thee. Well, so Jesus tells him the gospel. Peter says, no, not going to happen. I'm not going to let it happen. But he turned, Jesus, he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, some people will think that Satan possessed us. Uh, Satan at that time, or that uh, Peter was Satan, uh, or that Satan was standing there right alongside and nobody could see him, but, but Jesus and Jesus could see Satan there, you know, whispering in Peter's ear or something. Uh, but the whole point is this, that uh, it, it would be the, the plan of Satan that uh, uh, Jesus not fulfill his mission. So when Jesus says to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, I don't think he's seeing Peter as Satan. I think he's seeing Peter's uh, desire to prevent the death, burial, and resurrection from being satanic because Satan doesn't want man to uh, the remedy for sin and, and, and the gift of eternal life. Now, the Satan wants man to remain uh, following his plan, and that is just like what he said to Adam and Eve. No, God lied to you when he said, don't eat from that tree. You know, you, you'll die that day. He lied. You know, the truth is, if you eat from the tree, you'll, you'll be able to understand right and wrong. You'll know good and evil, and you can, you'll be like God. Therefore, you won't need God because you'll be able to make your own decisions about what is right and wrong. And uh, so that's the, the, the gospel of Satan. That's the, the false message of Satan. And that's the message that all the religions of the world are based upon. And that is that, that man can somehow, through his own efforts, uh, 
uh, eternal life in heaven, and man doesn't need God. But in Christianity, the message is that man cannot do it. We need to understand that, admit it, and realize that we do need God. We need God to save us. We need God to provide the covering. We need God to provide the blood sacrifice and, and uh, the payment for our sins. And then we see that here, um, in this case, uh, Peter, not understanding the significance of everything at that point, he was uh, saying that he would prevent it. He would not allow this to, to happen. So uh, yeah, I don't think that he's calling uh, Peter Satan exactly. I think, uh, wow, something's happening here, which is maybe I'm, my mouse is not working right here. So he's Jesus is not really thinking of Peter as Satan, but uh, thinking that Peter wanting Jesus's plan to fail to be stopped it would be that would be satanic okay so now let's look at another one I think I'll take time maybe one more here uh, let me see that was Matthew let's go back one more okay uh, Okay, let's look at Mark 1.13. Mark 1.13. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. All right, well... This is uh, Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness that's being cited here, and it says that Jesus was tempted of Satan. So we know that not only does if, if, if uh, Satan would attempt to tempt Jesus, then Jesus said all the things that uh, were happening to him, if if he's going to be persecuted, if he's going to be killed, uh, that uh, if it's good enough for the master, what about the servants? You don't think that you're going to be safe from all these, these persecutions. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should expect the same. You're not greater than your master. Well, I think the same thing applies to this kind of temptation. If Satan is going to try to tempt Jesus himself to... Uh, fail uh, to get off track uh, to not do what he came to do uh, then why should we not understand that, that we all also be under temptation and that after we get saved that uh, God's plans for us in terms of how he wants us to grow and mature and transform us spiritually and how he wants us to serve him through some kind of ministry work. All these desires of God, all these plans for us as Christians, uh, don't you think that Satan is also going to be tempting us, trying to get us off track, trying to get us going in the wrong direction? Let's look at that in context. Uh, I'll start with uh, the baptism of Jesus. It says, uh, uh, verse 9, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like it. The computer just wants to do things on its own without me even touching it for some reason. Do you want to? No. Okay. All 
I've got to find my place again now. Okay. And the spirit, like a dove, descending, and there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beast. angels ministered unto him. Well, the first part, let's talk about the baptism for a second. The, uh, have you ever studied modalism uh, and, and studied Trinitarianism? Do you know the difference between the two? Uh, to me, uh, I, I, I hold to the Trinitarian uh, explanation of the Godhead. But I have studied quite a bit the modalist or the oneness viewpoint. And there certainly are a lot of verses that uh, uh, modalism can use to justify their position. However, the main reason that modalism is clearly wrong to me are the situations we find in the scriptures where we see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit all existing simultaneously in there's modalism teaches that there's one God, he just changes into three different forms. Sometimes he changes into the Son, sometimes he changes into the Holy Spirit, sometimes he changes into the Father, but he exists in, in one form or the other. But it's all the same. And as a Trinitarian, you know, we believe that uh, God exists in, uh, as three distinct persons at the same time. Yet one God. And this scene at the baptism of Jesus is a perfect illustration of Trinitarianism. And then we have, we have Jesus right there being baptized. We have the Holy Spirit ascending above Jesus in the manner of a dove. So we have Jesus and the Holy Spirit distinctly, too. And then we hear a voice coming from somewhere. The Father saying, Behold, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. So we have uh, an illustration of the Trinity right there. Obviously, if modalism was correct, then that would be impossible because uh, God would have to exist in one form or the other, and He could change from one form to the other, operate in one mode or the other, and yet not simultaneously in all three. And in, Otherwise, if you're simultaneously all three, that is a, a picture of Trinitarianism, not modalism. So this, this uh, to me, this uh, baptism was a wonderful thing that I didn't want to uh, pass, if you're not aware of that. Uh, but then right after the baptism, it says, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. So immediately after Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days. We know that too. Uh, Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. Something about the, the number 40 that is uh, important here. Uh, so, um, in this 40 days, it says that he was tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts. That must be dangerous. Uh, and the angels ministered unto him. Um, he was tempted of Satan. What does it mean to be tempted of Satan? Does it mean that if I'm tempted, let's say that somebody I know, let's say a friend of mine, tries to tempt me to go do something that I really don't want to do, but they make it very tantalizing and very appealing and tempting. And if I'm tempted, uh, doesn't mean that I am actually being, really coming close and considering possibly going, let's say, 
in like in Las Vegas, Sin City, probably all big cities around the country are like this. But in Las Vegas, we have a lot of places called strip joints, uh, where we have a lot of exotic dancers or strippers. And uh, so, let's say a friend of mine wants me to go to a strip joint with him, and, and says they've also got some cocaine, and they're close friends with some really beautiful strippers. And that, uh, he wants me to go and enjoy all these things. And now that would mean that I'm being tempted by this person. But does that mean that I'm actually considering it and I'm really close to it? Or does it mean that this person is actually tempting me? He's trying to get me to do it and get putting all these tempting, tantalizing uh, uh, ideas in my head. But if I'm not really even considering it, I'm not really tempted. But he is attempting to tempt me. I think that's how this is. I don't believe that Jesus was actually tempted like he was really considering. And he was tempted to, to uh, do what the devil wanted to do. Whether it's, you know, change the stone to loaf or jump off the buildings to, to put the father in a position where he'd have to save him, let him let the, make the angels rescue him, or uh, bow down and worship Satan so that Satan would give him the whole earth world. And I don't think these things really tempted Jesus. I think Satan was tempting Jesus in terms of he was trying to entice him. But was Jesus really tempted? I, I don't think so. Okay, um, that'll be enough for this time. Since I'm by myself, I'm not going to try to talk for two hours today. One hour is enough. Uh, let me conclude the way I always do by talking about uh, the real reason I'm on YouTube. And that is that uh, I'm, I'm a Christian. A Christian is a person who uh, relies completely on Christ for salvation. And after I became a Christian, the Holy Spirit of God, which lives inside of me, has been transforming me. This has been going on for 28 years now. And during that time, the Holy Spirit has been prompting me to and to, to do certain things and uh, discouraging from me doing other things. And my life has really changed a lot. But one of the things that the Holy me is a, a desire to tell people the good news about Jesus. Uh, that's what we call witnessing. Uh, witnessing, telling people about uh, our experience uh, learning about Jesus and getting saved and telling them the good news, how they can enjoy this too. It's evangelism. That's what the Apostle Paul was. He was an evangelist rather than a pastor. And I believe that's my calling in life too, to evangelize, to uh, spread the seeds of the gospel. And, and hopefully some of the people will have ears to hear and believe and be saved. So uh, I, I would be negligent if I did any kind of video and and neglected to tell you this good news. Now, the word gospel is Greek, and it literally translates to good news. So if someone tries to tell you about Christianity, and the gospel, and they tell you something that doesn't really sound like good news, then all the automatically alarms should go off. You say, that doesn't sound right. It's supposed to be good news. If they tell you that you've got to join a religion, become a very religious person, follow some set of religious rules, work really, really hard to please God, and keep your fingers crossed, hoping that it's good enough, and that maybe God will let you into heaven. If that's, if that's what they're telling you, then you should know right away. It's a dead giveaway. That's not the gospel. That's not good news. That's fear. That's doubt. Am I, you'd be afraid. Am I doing enough? Did I, did I please God enough? I don't. I can't be sure. I, you can never have assurance 
you can never have joy and peace. So uh, I'm going to tell you the, the real good news. And, and it is that God understood that man was in a helpless situation. See, we, Adam and Eve fell in the garden. They, they did not believe God. God told them, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or you'll surely die that day. But later, Satan again, he came in and he told Adam and Eve, no, no, it's not true what God said. The truth is that you won't die that day. Instead, you'll be like God and you'll know the right from wrong. You know good and evil. God doesn't want you to have, to have that knowledge. God doesn't want you to be like God. So they were tempted and they chose to believe Satan. And I believe that's the sin that caused the fall, unbelief, not believing God and instead believing Satan, basically calling God a liar and believing Satan. That led them to disobey and eat from the not tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And once that happened, they, and what, at that very moment, what happened is uh, they, they, uh, they died spiritually. They, they still lived physically for eight or nine hundred years. But spiritually, their spirit, which was connected to God, the Holy Spirit was living in them, was severed. There was no relationship spiritually between them and God. Uh, and they were like zombies walking around spiritually dead. And, and, uh, and because of that, they could not, they did not have eternal life. They were going to die. And they tried to remedy the situation through their own works and it, it failed. God had to provide a covering for them. I, I believe that they learned that uh, they, they couldn't do it and that they needed God to provide the covering, God to provide the solution. And that's been the theme of the Bible in all uh, 66 books. Well, not all 66, the scriptures, we can see this bloody trail. Uh, I have a series called The Bloody Trail. Watch that and you'll see there are, throughout all the scriptures we see uh, uh, this picture that we must put our faith in God to provide salvation instead of putting our faith in our ability to, to do it on our own. So Adam and Eve fell. They got a death sentence. And, and, and we, offspring, who are uh, generation after generation, the children of Adam and Eve, we were all born with a birth defect, a kind of a genetic disorder. And that is that our bodies all fail. We eventually will die. But we're spiritually dead. We do not have eternal life. Uh, but God knew that man would try to figure out all the solutions on his own. And God knew that man couldn't solve the problem because the problem was we would have to become perfect. And, and uh, we, we were born imperfect, so there's a problem from our birth. And then even after that, we practice the things that we practice and do in our lives are, are not perfect. And uh, therefore, we are incapable of uh, doing what Jesus said, go be perfect, because your Father in heaven is perfect. So no matter how we struggle, we can join all the religions in the world. We can become the most religious person in the world. And yet, Scripture says it all falls short of the glory of God. The glory of God, I believe, is, is Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life. He set a standard of perfection. That's the standard we've got to reach if we want to get to heaven through our own effort. But if a person's going to be honest, They'll understand the verse that says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. We, we, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we have to admit that, no, we're not perfect. Uh, you might be better than your neighbor, but you're not as good as Jesus. So you're not perfect. And because of that, you cannot get into heaven. You cannot have eternal life, no matter how you try. So what I want you to understand, what the scriptures want you to understand, 
hopeless situation you find yourself in. But God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but instead have eternal life. God knew you couldn't do it, so he decided he would provide a solution. He would become a man in Jesus. He would live a perfect life. I get credit for Jesus's perfection. That's what the good news is, is that I couldn't live a sinless life, so Jesus lived it for me, and I get credit for it because of my faith in him. Uh, Jesus died on a cross and paid for all my sins. So I don't have to pay for my sins because Jesus paid for my sins. Because of my faith in Jesus, I don't have to pay for my sins, and I receive his righteousness. I receive eternal life as a free gift. I receive the Holy Spirit of God living inside me, bringing my spirit alive and transforming me into a child of God. And that's what's available to you right now. If you're watching this, uh, it's, it's really simple. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Salvation is easy. But a lot of people can't do it. It's hard for them because they think, no, I, this, I've got to do something on my own. I've got to work for it. I've got to earn it. You know, but you've got to understand that you can't. You're defeated. And now you need to call on the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. His name is Jesus. Call on Jesus to save you. Don't think you can do it on your own. Don't think that your performance has anything to do with it. Instead, say, as the scripture says, uh, the righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. No matter how good you think you are, God's not impressed. So understand and accept that fact and realize that you can't do it. You need to be saved. The scripture says only God can save you. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Savior God. So put your faith in this person, Jesus. He's God. He became a man. He died for your sins. Your sin is no longer a barrier between you and God. You can go to heaven now because sins are paid for. You can live forever if you put your faith in Jesus. He gives you the Holy Spirit. He gives you eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that sound like good news? It is good. It's the, the greatest news. It's the greatest story ever told. I hope you do it. Put your faith in our great Savior God, Jesus Christ. Do it. Make a comment right now. Bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, his name is Jesus Christ.